Okay, so we left off talking about the alternating series, and I want to remind you about a couple of things with the alternating series. Give me one second, I should have brought this up already. So the important thing is going to be not that I would bring it to school. Straight, they would straight. Okay, so the important thing with the alternating series is that it's very easy to predict what you can predict an error estimate using the subsequent term. So we talked a little bit about this at the end of class. So with an alternating series that converges, the partial sums are going to be bouncing around whatever the limit of the series is. And what we can do then is use the next term as an upper bound on the error. So. The next term is an upper bound on the error. So let's try one of these. So this says determine how many terms of the following convergent series must be summed to get a remainder less than 10 to the negative fourth. Right, so we, we're going to be adding up numbers. Let's write out what our terms look like. So we first we plug in a zero, so we're going to get a one. And then we plug in a one, so we'll have a negative. And it looks like looks like we'll have one minus one to start out. So that's zero, one, and then we plug in a two, and it's going to be positive, so we get one half. And then we plug in three, so it will be negative. So it's going to look like this. And we plug in four. Then we plug in five. Okay. So this converges to one over e. Can somebody type one over e into their calculator? Actually, I can probably just do it right in decimals. I'll put. It, I'll do it right in decimals so we can kind of make a comparison. So one divided by e, right there. So. 3679, roughly, 0.3679. OK, so here we have an alternating series. We know it converges. If we add up the first three terms, this is called S sub 3. S sub 3 will be equal to 1 half. The subsequent terms, absolute value, is going to be an approximation for the error. So this is going to be a, an error bound. So the error bound is 1 sixth. So if we were to take this approximation, S sub 3, r sub 3 will be equal to the true sum minus the partial sum, and we'll take the absolute value. All right? Does that make sense? Sure. Right? The remainder is the difference between the sum and the approximation. Everyone okay with that? So if we're adding up, t let's just suppose we have a, a, a finite series with 10 terms. If we add up the first eight, then the sum of the last two would be the remainder, if we were just going to add up the first eight. If we added up the first three, the last seven would be the remainder, if we only had a series of 10 terms. So here we have an infinite series. We add up these three, then the rest is going to be the remainder. Okay? And so if we take the absolute value of that, that will mean that we have an error amount of whatever this number is. And that, the true remainder, will be less 
than one sixth. So that term right there is going to give us a bound on the error. So similarly, if we added up the first four terms, whatever that adds up to. So we're going to subtract off a sixth. So we'll have 3 over 6 minus 1 over 6 is 2 over 6, so that's a third. This next term right there, that is going to be our new error bound. 124. So we will be within 1 24th of the real sum. If we add up the first five terms, S sub 5, we will be within 1 20th of the total sum. If we add up the first six terms, then we look at the seventh term. The seventh term's absolute value gives us an error bound on that partial sum, the S sub 7. Okay, so let's, we don't really need this right here. So in general, you can think of the sum as the partial sum plus the remainder. And when you subtract off the partial sum from S, that's giving you a measure of the remainder. And if you take its absolute value, you can think of that as the error. Okay, so we want to then figure out how many terms we need to go to have a remainder that's less than 10 to the negative 4. So what we need to do is figure out when n, or what, what n needs to be to have a term less than 10 to the negative 4. So if we look at the magnitude of our term, our, the magnitude of our term is 1 over k factorial. We just ignore the minus sign. And we want that to be less than 10 to the negative 4. So if we can figure out the k for which that expression is true, then we back up one term, and those are the terms that we add together. So that's all we have to do. Let's do it. So we multiply both sides by 10 to the fourth. That's 10,000. Multiply both sides by k factorial. So we want to know what k value is the first k value that gives us a k factorial bigger than 10,000. So if we come in here, I don't know, let's try 4 factorial, 5 factorial. They start growing pretty fast. Let's try 7 factorial. 7 factorial, 8 factorial. That jumps a ton, huh, from 7 to 8 factorial. So 7 factorial is 5,000-ish, 8 factorial 40,000-ish. So the first k value that takes us over the limit, the first k value is k equals 8. Okay, so now we have to be very strategic and think about how many terms we have to add together. So it says, how many terms do we have to add together? Now remember that this index starts at 0, not 1. So we have to keep that in mind. So let's put the little k equals 0 here, k equals 1, k equals 2, k equals 3, k equals 4, k equals 5, etc. So when k is 8, when k is 8, we are going to have 1 over k factorial being, uh, being more than 10,000. When k is 8. So we want to add up all the terms in front of that. Just like this term is the error bound on the sum of all this, and this term is the error bound on the sum of all this, and this is the, the error bound on the sum of all this, that's the idea. So when k is 8, that's going to be the error bound on everything in front of it. So we have to add up from k equals 0 to k equals 7. How many terms is that? Eight. eight terms. So we're going to add up eight terms. So although you don't need to, the exact, okay, so that's it. So eight terms is how many we add up. 
So it's not that k is equal to 8 that's giving us this. You always have to go back and look at where your series starts. And our series starts at 0, so it corresponds that the 8 and the 8 are going to be the same. If this series started at 1, it would be different. Right? So we have to, if it start, what would happen if it started at 1? K would equal 9. So if it started at 1, we would add up the first 9 terms. Uh, did I say that right? I subtracted the wrong direction. <clears throat> seven terms. So let, let's go through the logic. So if this started at 1, <laughs> so, so if we had to go out to k equals 8, if we go out to k equals 8, that would be the 8th term, and that 8th term would be the error on everything in front of it, and there would be 7 terms in front of it if we started at 1. It's so we would add eights. up the first 7 terms. You're just starting from 1 now, so you're just, uh, yes. Yeah, yes. Yes. As long as I understand. Um, how did you get 10,000 from 10 to the negative 4? Uh, that's 1 over 10,000, oh, and then okay. we cross multiplied. So it was 1 divided by 10,000, cross multiplied, puts it in the numerator. Okay. That works. All right, so let's do this one. So again, we have, uh, they, they know what the series converges to. It doesn't really matter. But we want the same, the same scenario. We want the magnitude of this term, and the magnitude just means take away that switch, take away the minus sign. We want this to be less than 1 over 10,000. And this was given. They said less than 10 to the negative 4. So we cross multiply. And we want to know the first k value for which this is true. So we'll take the cubed root of 10,000 which I don't think is a perfect cube. Cube root of 10,000. We'll subtract 1 and divide by 2. So we're looking for the first integer bigger than that. First integer bigger than whatever that number is. So we're going to do 10,000 raised to the one-third power uh, and then what did we do? Minus, minus, one, minus one. one. And then we wanted to divide the whole thing by two. So we'll Alright, so that's 10.27-ish. <coughs> so 10.27 Two seven blah 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 blah. We need k to be bigger than that, and k is an integer. If k is an integer, then the first k value that will work is k equals eleven. So, when we get to k equals eleven, that will be our error bound on everything added up in front of it. So we have our terms that are being added up. We can plug in numbers and get a sense of what this is. When k is 0, it's positive. So we're going to get 1 over 1. And then when k is 1, we get a negative. Down here, we get 3 cubed. Let's just leave it as a cube. And then plus 1. So that's 0. That's 1. Plug in 2, we get 5 cubed. Does that look good to everybody? Then that'll be negative, and it's going to keep on going. So. When k is 11, we will have, let's just say, let's write it down, for k equals 11, we're going to have, we're going to ignore the minus sign. We're just looking at the magnitude of the term. So we'll have 23 to the 3 in the denominator. So that is going to be less than 10 to the negative 4. So that tells us that we are going to add up everything in front of it. So we're going to add terms from k equals 0 to k equals 10. So when k equals 11, we get the 
value less than one over ten to the negative one, less than one over ten thousand. So we add up everything in front. So when k is eleven, we generate our error term that's less than our threshold. We add up everything in front of it. Wouldn't that be negative right there? One over ten. Yes. So this this here. Yeah. This is negative. But for the error, we want the magnitude of the next term. So for k equals 11, we're ignoring the minus sign. It's the magnitude of the subsequent term that gives you the error on everything added up in front of it. When we think of error, we should always be thinking positive. Right. Right. Error, we're thinking it's OK, it's within. So we'll think of the error as positive number. Quick question. Yeah? Where did you get 10,000 again? From Given. That's from the 10 to the oh, it said in the question. Okay. Because I don't have the notes in front of me. Yeah, so, so given kind of that we want to be less than one ten thousandth from the actual sum. Gotcha. So this tells us if we add up the first 11 terms, that partial sum will be within one ten thousandth of pi cubed over 32. So we're going to add up the first 10, the first 11 terms. That will be, so this is exactly what our calculator would do. Our calculator has a way to calculate how many terms it has to go to be within whatever the screen width is number of decimal points. Okay. So, you guys ready to try one? So try this one. So this one, the error bound, we want to be less than 10 to the negative 3. And this one starts at 1, so you're going to have to, you always have to think about where your series starts when you're trying to figure out how many terms you're adding. So 10 to the negative 3. So is it 1,000? Yep. Yeah, 1,000. Mm -hmm. Well, you guys are starting. I'll write out the first few terms just so we can get a sense of what this looks like. This actually looks Oh, yeah. I think you just said it, Karina. This is the same exact series, isn't it? Yeah, it just starts at 1. It starts at a different place. And it's 10 to the third. Yeah, different threshold. It's this How many people are done? Do we round for these situations? Mm-hmm. Okay. 
So you got to go from one to six. So you're taking endurance since we're starting at one. Oh, one to six turns. You're right. So it's one over, no, because you're starting at one. Six turns. Yeah, because you're starting at one. So you still got five. So it's one over 11 to the third. So then you're going to add up the terms in front of it. Oh, and then the one to six. Oh, and then you're going to add up the terms in front of it. Yeah, the, no, the error is 1 over 11. So when k is 11, you're Listen, getting the error. Listen, someone doesn't even know how to complete the square. So you want to add up everything in front of it. Oh, that's a lot. So you're going to add up for at least four turns. I learned. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. You must have taught uh, the square. I promise you I never learned it until... How do we know that? Yeah. So he what brought we it want, in Calcutta. Like, what? what? It's a fundamental, bro. To be less than one. Texas thousand. didn't see it that way. Either. So that's yeah. a less than. Texas. Yeah. And that's a less well, than. No. But then we did so division here. But they made me take Texas. No, history. only if it's division by a negative. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Sorry. So your so your first k value will be k equals five. So when k is five. So how do we answer this thing? You put it into your calculator. Well, yeah, listen, that's enough out of here. I'm just saying, like, can I see what you got? Miss Morose, Miss Morose, and Melancholy today. What's going on? I need you to be vibrant today. It's Halloween. I conserve my energy for trick or treating. Your kids oh, are gone. <laughs> I have to work, so I don't know. How do you put infinity on here? No, you don't need infinity much. I'm done. Sorry. <laughs> One over eleven to the third. Where'd you get eleven to the third? Four point five. Yeah. Whoa. Okay, I got it. So and you add all the first and you just write add first right there. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. This. Um, so what we would say. The fifth term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Some of the fifth term has to be four terms. Yeah. Four terms. Which term? And so it's four terms. 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 So the error is it? You know, count plus minus this, from this error is it? Oh, you should stop. Like, is it big B? Yes. This like this one. Right. This one says that the um, it's eleven true three. sum so will be you stop at ten. Add ten. partial sum plus minus ten. You add from zero okay. to ten. Okay. So first, the regular number is first. Where's K? Four first quarter. Yeah, for sure. So you add up your first four values. <laughs> 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 That's awesome. Value less than one over a thousand. Your cost is five, so you add up everything in front of it. Yeah, I'm surprised Kiki dressed up. I thought all of you were going to be lame. <laughs> so none of you guys dressed up. What's up with that? Wah, wah. Oh, you did. I'm sorry. I forgot you could have the dance. I'm going to dress up tonight. I'm not going to dress up tonight. It's fun dressing up, man. It's like the only thing. It's good to have a conversation. They're all talking. It's very sweet, actually. Okay, so same idea here. It's just that we have 1 over 1,000 instead of 1 over 10,000. Yeah. So we want to know. It sucks, dude. When. Is this true? <coughs> we want the first k value for which that's true. We cross multiply. So we're going to get 1,000 less than 2k plus 1 to the third to the three. Take the cube root of both sides. Cube root, that's 10. Subtract 1 divided by 2, and we get 4.5, I think. So the first k value for which that's true is k equals 5. So that implies k is 5. Oh, so we come out here and look. There's k equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 right there. We're ignoring the minus sign. So 1 over 11 to the 3, that's this. And that's less than 1 over 1,000. If we came to k equals 4, that's more than 1 over 1,000. So that is, this tells us that if we add up the first four terms, 
will be within one thousandth of the actual sum, which is right here. So the actual sum on the previous slide told us that if we started at zero, so if we had a one in front, so I just did that, subtracted one, so this will be the sum of that series. And did somebody add up the first four terms? Yeah, it's negative point two three seven five. Negative point two three seven five. Two three seven five. Wait, you don't add up all the way to I'm five? Not like that. No. no. Something that doesn't seem quite. Yeah. Right. It's just. You I add those four terms. Right? Okay. Yeah. okay, say it is 0 0.03. Yeah. 0 0.058. Yeah. 0 0.58. Zero five eight. Okay, that's more sense. That makes more sense. Yes. So this is the sum of the first four terms. And writing the summation symbol would be for the top, right? Starting at one, or is it for the? Starting at one. And to what? To four. We add up one to four. Add up one to four, we'll get that number, and that number will be less than one thousand from that number. I see. See it? Mm -hmm. So the k value corresponds to the next yeah, yeah, term. Yeah, yeah. So like what you start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if the question, so if we, if someone said add up the first six terms, then you would say you are within one over fifteen cubed of that number there. So if you add it up all the way to here, the first six terms, then you know you're within 1 over 15 cubed of that number. And that's what's cool about an alternating series. However far you add up, it's the magnitude of the next term that tells you the error between the sum of the first n terms and the actual sum. There's no other series that has that cool property where you can just look at the next term. That's convenient. Very convenient. So the final answer would look like what? Uh, four terms. We add up the first four terms. Is that, a, is that what you write? And yep. The question said how many terms. Put a box around it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Or cool. you could put a bubble around it. What about like a You could put a scary face around a it. Pentagram. You could put, do you want to put a pentagram around it? No. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. So four. Too much. Like, is there like a standard version of the alternating series? Like, what if like the k had like minus one in the power of negative one? So it would switch the symbol. No standard form for it. All you have is a minus. All the only key for an alternating series is that it alternates. Okay. That's it. But this is, okay. It doesn't so matter. it could be a k plus one, could be a k minus one, could be a two k right. plus one, could so, be as long so as it up alternates. So for a telescoping series, we can apply. It. No, because a telescoping series, we don't have this closed form, right? When you, when you have that close, when you do the telescoping series, you know, you get the sort of A minus B plus C minus D, but your formula is generating this whole thing. If, your for if you could then rewrite it so that your formula was generating each of these individually, then yes. But you, the way the, the way the telescoping series are given to us, your you know, your a sub n generates that that one right there is a sub one, right? So it's generating both the positive and negative portion of it. So you'd have to somehow rewrite and create a sum and that would give you each of those individually. So if you could do that, then you could use the alternating series for it. But in general, that's pretty hard. Okay, one more. And another one. So we want to, we'll just go through it together. We want to have it be less than a thousandth. So we want to figure out the first k value for which the term magnitude is less than a thousand. We want that to be true. So the first k value that does that for us. You guys go ahead and figure that out while I write out the first few terms. This thing looks familiar again. Mm, it's just a plus one. Spooky. <laughs> Very spooky. Oh my Very spooky. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me cheat off. <laughs> you know, no, no properties of factorials like that that we can do. So we just have to plug in numbers. So we would want to figure out the first factorial. What do you, yeah, what are you doing We're just going to plug thing? these so in and figure out which factorial. There's not like an upside down. It's so one. The it's like the it's nine. Nine. Yeah. Yeah. We wish. Come on. Undo a factorial. Which factorial is the first one that goes over 1,000? Uh, seven. 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 That's what I guess. That's like a okay. difference. Seven. Seven. <laughs> so seven factorial is the one. So <laughs> what number gives us seven? Oh, three. So th if we plug in a three there, we get seven factorial. So K will be three. So if we have a factorial type of setup, it's just trial and error until we find the right K value. There's no inverse factorial. Oh, why not? Yeah. So this tells us then that when k is 3, so 1 over 7 factorial, this is the first term that's less than 1 over 1,000. So that means we add up these two terms. So if we add up these first two terms, we will be within 1,000th of the actual sum of this series. So we add up two terms. So we will be within 1,000th of S. Are we keeping these Whatever like, in that series. form, or are we actually it's getting six, decimals? Uh, decimals for what? Decimals or keep it just that, like the Oh, line. with this, you could yeah. type this out. You could type this into your calculator and get a decimal. Okay. Yeah, either way. Yeah. You could either leave it as a rational number or as a decimal. What do you get when you put that as a rational number? Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Blah. 19. 1 over 6. I think it's 19. Say that again? 19. 19 wow. over 120th. Yeah. That seems reasonable. And then as a decimal? 1.583 repeating. With only the three repeats. So, 0.158, sorry. Say it once again. 0.158, not 1.158. Oh, okay, thank you. 0.158 repeat. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> it's definitely less than one. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so you could write either one. Cool. So 19, 120 S, that's going to be within a thousandth of whatever the S is, which we don't know. We do not know. It says it's, it's greater than one over one thousandth, or wasn't it five thousand? Less than one over a thousand. Oh. So we want the error to be less than 1,000. So when we go, so that'll be the first term that has a value less than 1 over 1,000. So that'll be the error for the sum of the first two. Now, if we figure out whatever 1 over 9 factorial is, that will give us the error on the sum of the first three. Well, can't you? just go as far as you want to because it, it doesn't specifically say that it, like that it has to be like the first one right yeah so it says less than 1000 so that could be like 20th term that's true yeah they they should stay what is the f what is the least number of terms that you can add together and be within one over a thousand of each okay of the sum that's what they should say right that's what they're implying. So, yeah, that's <laughs> what the test will say. That's what the test will say. That's what the test will say. Yeah, what is the first, what is the least, so this should say, what is the least number of terms that you can add together and be within 1,000 of that? It should say. Actually, yeah. Question? No. No, she says. No. 
Yeah. No, uh, she says. I don't have questions in front of you. Then I go home and I'm like, what? Then you have a question? You have all the questions. Yeah, that's the proper procedure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Will we ever have a greater than? Uh, you want your, you want, no. <laughs> because it's because we wouldn't ask that question. When is the error greater than something, right? You always want to know less than. You know, you want to minimize the error. Right? You're not trying. I mean, sometimes when I grade your test, it feels like you're trying to maximize the error, but that Burr. should be. You should be trying to. The concept is that you're minimizing Singers. the error. You want to know how far out you have to go. How many hours do I have to study so that I have a minimal number of errors? Oh, we're trying, my dude. We're trying. Yeah, try. Those are like I a know. couple it's hours. Not hard. Right? Minimum. It's not hard? 30, 40 minutes. All right, let's talk about this type of convergence that is up here on the board. So the concept of absolute and conditional convergence, this only applies for series that have alternating signs. Now, technically speaking, it does not have to be for an alternating series. You could have some weird series where there's three pluses and then three minuses and then four pluses and then four minuses. So this idea is going to uh, apply for any series that's not all positive termed. So there could be minuses. In particular, it does apply to an alternating series. That's where we're going to see most of our applications. So. The idea is this. If the series of absolute values converges, then we say that the series without the absolute values is absolutely convergent. Why absolutely? Because if you put absolute values in there, it does converge. So if you have some series and you know it converges, you can further classify the convergence as absolute if you took away all the minuses and it still converged. The absolute value of a sub k, that's what it's doing. It's taking away all the minuses and it's turning everything into positive terms. And so what we say is that if you've got this convergent series and you take away the minuses and it still converges, then we say that it's absolutely convergent. You know, there's a lot of series that you need the minuses in order to get convergence, like the harmonic. When we look at the harmonic series, we know that this harmonic series diverges. That goes to infinity, and we know that this alternating harmonic, we saw last class that this converges to natural log of 2. So if you were to take away those minuses, you would have divergence. So this series, the alternating harmonic, is not absolutely convergent. It is what we refer to as conditionally convergent. Condition. So if the absolute values diverge, but the series without the absolute values converges, then we say that that series is conditionally convergent. You need the minuses. So this is what you're saying, the situation where you can make it converge to whatever. So that is one of the weirdest theorems in math. If you have a conditionally convergent series, you can rearrange the terms to converge to any number you want. <laughs> if you have an, no, that's power. <laughs> if you have an absolutely convergent series, it doesn't matter how you rearrange it, it will still converge to the same number. But if you have a conditionally convergent series, this you can fun. rearrange it so that it converges to any number you want, any real number. And how does one go about that? Conditional very, very difficult process. There is a prescriptive way to do it, though. Absolutely. If you want the series to converge to 7, there is a way, there's a prescriptive way that you can build your, your rearrangement so that it will converge to 7. You have to Just learn magic. You have to learn. I was going to say, this sounds math. like the shadow math. This does feel like shadow math. Will that be on a test? No. Okay. Yeah. No. It just converge to a value of your choice. Yeah. <laughs> Zero. Come up with an infinite number of terms that adds up to. On the paper. Illuminati. Yeah, no, that, that is. Uh, doing rearrangements of a conditionally convergent series is something you will not do for many years. 
It's or very ever. difficult. <laughs> or ever. <laughs> Nicholas. But since it converts to a up. point at the tail, wouldn't you have to change an infinite number yes. of terms? Yes. Yes. So you have to define a process to generate the terms. You have to define some way to systematically change the, to order the terms. Like maybe you do uh, one plus a third and then minus a half and then plus a fifth, you know, so you'd have to come up with a pattern to how you rearrange it. Ethan! Oh, looks like you had a question. You're so excited, too. I'm so excited. What is Ethan. that used in, Mr. Boss? Uh, very theoretical math. Okay, so like, not our level. <laughs> <laughs> no, not on the bridges and highways of Colorado. Not really, no. like, yeah, in Dennis? reality right so now. So how would, how would you like define it's absolutely? It's like, the collapse. Do, does it mean, like, like definitely? Like the same? Absolute, simple. Well, when you hear the word absolute, you should be thinking absolute value bars. It's just... So it's really a series will be absolutely convergent if you turn like all of the minuses, the pluses, and it still converges. Like you. So if you do this, if you turn all these to plus, yeah, that's true. and you get a convergent series, then it's called absolutely convergent. That's awesome. that's cool. So when you hear the word absolute, you should be thinking absolute value bars. In other words, no negatives. Right. No negatives. But, but what does it mean when it converges absolutely? What does it tell us? It just tells us that the minuses aren't required to get convergence. Right? Like here, if you take the minuses away, it diverges. Right, right. So if it's absolutely convergent, that means that the terms go to zero really fast. Okay. Because the minuses aren't necessary. You don't need them in there. It's still going to converge anyway. So if it's absolutely convergent, it's going to converge to certainly a number that's bigger so it's kind of because like you turn the minuses into pluses. So it's kind of like referring to like error, basically? Um, error, error, error. You can think of it as, error. I don't know if I would think of it as error, because with error we're always terminating our, we're looking at a partial sum. Right. And then the tail is where the error lives. Um, well, like I'm saying, when it converges absolutely, it's kind of like a reassurance. Yeah, 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 I mean, you, you are reassured, I guess. I mean, I don't feel reassured by it, but you might. <laughs> Max? Is there like a form of absolute value that turns everything to negative? Yeah, negative times absolute value. Outside of the absolute value. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 That's fair like, enough. Right? <laughs> Does the Riemann zeta function converge? He's not wrong. <laughs> the Riemann zeta function, does it converge absolutely? Or conditionally? Uh, Riemann zeta oh, function the converges for every number with a... Um, it is absolute convergence on Riemann zeta function. Absolute convergence. But it's only absolute convergence for the <laughs> the real part has to be bigger than one half, I think. Something. Okay, so the first thing, if you have a series with all positive terms, it makes no sense to talk about absolute and conditional. If it's if the terms are all positive, either it converges or it diverges. There's no other way to classify the convergence. And there's never a way to classify, um, we don't ever classify divergence. You know, so, you know, we just say the series diverges. Um, so classifying convergence is for when you have a, term, a series that has negative numbers in it somewhere, in particular, an alternating series is a good example. So we've got an infinite series. If it converges, and the a sub k, some of them are negative, then we can talk about it being conditional or absolute. Conditional or absolute. Okay, let's decide. We have this series here that alternates, and we have our beautiful alternating series test that only has two steps. Step one, alternating series test. We look at the limit of the positive part of a sub n. We ignore the switch. And what is the limit of this expression as k goes to infinity? Zero. 
check. So that's the first step. <laughs> almost, a, almost took a square root. Yee. Of zero, but it's still been zero, so yeah. technically it would have worked. It's just been superfluous. It would have been superfluous. Yeah. That would be bum fuzzling. Yeah, I'm just an adult smart. <laughs> okay, so just because Keegan uses big words. Indubitably. Oh, wait, no. Wrong, so I use that one way too wrong much. conclusion. Is that okay, erroneous? So, so <laughs> I need to get back here. <laughs> trying to liven up the class. There's way too much remainder up there. So the. Uh, <laughs> First step is just showing that the limit is zero. Yeah. And everybody agree with that? Yes. Yeah. So that's the same thing as we use for the divergence test. If this doesn't go to zero, then we know it diverges. So first step of the alternating series test, limit is zero. Second step, we want to show that the terms are getting smaller. If we can show that the oh. terms are getting smaller, that's it. Then the alternating series converges. So let's check. So a sub n is and we're, we're not, when we talk about an alternating series, a sub n does not include the minus sign. So we have this. A little question mark. I want to know if that's true. Cross multiply. And I, you can probably, you, you can make a justification to stop there. Usually you, it's convenient to get all the way to the point where you have something that is completely <laughs> obvious. Plus minus and zero. Oh, yeah. So you can always get down to a place where you just have numbers where there's. And that does not make sense. <laughs> did I put the inequality? Is it one is less than Oh, zero? what did I do there? I switched the inequality symbol. For was the that right. a question mark uh, above the? Yeah, yes. that's a question mark. Because we're trying to show that that's true. We're trying to show we want. This is what we want to show. We want to show that the terms are getting smaller. So we would like to show this, and we can't justify it yet. I thought I was. Can't justify it yet. Can't justify it yet. There we can justify it. So was I. I thought I was losing my damn mind. Yeah, I know. Like, what if? Going I'm crazy here. I'm often wrong in this class, so I'm like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> So this now backs all the way up to there, and we conclude that that's true. Does so we've that got our two check marks. So therefore, the series converges by the alternating series test. So therefore, convergence by alternating series test. So it's absolute? We haven't decided yet. So the series converges, and it has minus signs. Now we can ask the question, is it, con is it conditional or absolute? So that's the next part. So first, the only way we ever talk about convergence as being absolute or conditional is if we have a convergent alternating series. So now we ask the next step. So, oh, OK, well, are those minuses necessary? Well, we just did that in the first. We did? So now we're going to consider the absolute, consider, we're going to consider the series with absolute values, so we're going to take away the minuses. Well, it's not going to change. And what's true about this series? It's still going to diverges because it's a P series with P. Amen, sister. <laughs> it is a divergent P series. Because the k is less than one. So p is equal to one half, which is less than one. Therefore, diverge, divergent p series. That means that the condition, the, the so convergence that we found here, is conditional. So therefore, conditional convergence. No, we stipulations. Yes. Divergent. I'm yes. Not, how come we ignored the the, neg the alternation for limit as well? Then? Uh, that's what the alternating series test says to do. The alternating series test says look at the magnitudes, and if the limit of the magnitude is zero and the magnitudes are getting smaller, then it converges. Right. Okay. So that's the alternating series right. test. 
And then when we analyze the actual series of absolute values, we erase the minus 1 to the k, and we analyze this with our prior tests. So because that's a p-series with a fractional exponent, diverges. Terms still go to 0, but they don't go to 0 fast enough. Mm -hmm. So it's conditionally convergent because the limit goes to 0, but the absolute value of this series is divergent. Yes. So it's conditionally convergent because the series converges, but the series of absolute values diverges. And that's your final answer with the box, right? Yep. Conditionally convergent. On the test. So conditionally convergent, the series converges. That means with the minuses, you have convergence. But the series of absolute values diverges. If you throw, if you turn all the minuses to pluses, then you get divergence. So if I'm a really good guesser on the test, and I just kind of <laughs> yeah, I never look at your work. I could give you, I could give you a test where it just has the blanks for the answers. You want that? Oh sure. Actually, <laughs> I don't know. How do you feel about that? <laughs> no, you don't. What's his What's his name? Does that on his test? I think. Who? What's his, what's his name? name? The hippie, the hippie guy. Cody. Yes. <laughs> Cody <laughs> Fisher. Actually, he does that kind of test. He leaves though. room and then you put your answer guy. at the bottom. He's like, hey man. Here's your test, bro. Here's your test, bro. He's like, let me kill you with this algebra real quick. Yeah, no. That guy is pretty rad, dude. <laughs> okay, so let's look at this rad series. Anyhow. Is that Darling. still a word? Yeah. No. I used it yesterday. Right? Rad? Yeah, that's a word. Oh, it's still, it's still, it's still it's going so strong, okay? No Only in certain groups, though, I think. Only in the rad groups. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. I'm not that old yet, okay? Okay, we so everyone agree that this is an alternating like series? Years old. 16 years old. Thank you, Duke. 15? Okay. okay. So let's do the alternating series test. So we take the limit of the magnitude of the terms as k goes to infinity, and what is that limit? So there the base is less than 1. It's a fraction. So as we start multiplying it by itself, we're getting numbers that are approaching 0. Second. Check. 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 We need our checks. And then the next part, we want, we want to show that as we creep out into the tail of the series, things are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's what we want to show. So we take, and we're just looking at the magnitude of the terms. So there's our a sub k. We would like to show, oh, I just did it again. We want to show that it's smaller than, that it's getting smaller if we go out further. That's what we want to show. So we're going to cross multiply. And we'll get 3 to the k plus 1 greater than 3 to the k. Cross that's multiply. Cool. Say that again? Mm -hmm. I would not take a log here. Why? I would not you take a log. You I would. <laughs> there's an easier way. Okay. If we use the laws of exponents, then we can divide everything by 3 to the k, and we get this. And let's put our little question mark there. Is that oh, true? That's, that is true. Is that Just true? Go Oh, 3 is greater than 1. That's true. Yay. My goodness. True. So then we go all the way back through. We've shown that this is true, so that's a check. So then we conclude, therefore, converge it's gonna be by alternating series test. Wait, would natural log be wrong, or does it just make it harder? Um, it would make it harder. It would make it harder because... Well, no, it would still work. It would just be a little more, a few extra steps. It would still work. Okay. You could do this. So you could we have to do more work? We did k plus 1 is going to be, like, you can intuitively see. At this point here? Yeah. At this point here, you could make a statement saying the exponent on the 3 is bigger on the left, so since the base is bigger than 1. It would be like, arrow, be like, C. <laughs> If you're going to jump out early before you get to a place where it's totally obvious, you should say something. You should say something. 
So I don't think it mattered in this situation, but why wouldn't we have the negative in there? For this analysis? Yeah. So the alternating series test says that we compare the magnitudes of the term. And when you look at the definition of an alternating series, the way they write the definition is sigma minus 1 to the k a sub k. So the minus sign is not included in the a, in the a sub k or the a sub n. So the minus, it's the only series where we actually keep the minus outside of the a sub n. So it's not part of it. So when they write a sub n and a sub n plus 1, there's no minus in it. So this one is not conditional. I don't know yet. Did you already do the next step? Well, you can already look at it and be like... You did it? No. How are you doing? Oh, wait, it's a negative one. How are you... How do you know? Because yeah. yeah. she's just that Because cool. she just knows. So now we know that we have a convergent alternating series. So then it makes sense to ask, well, what type of convergence is it? Is it absolute or is it conditional? Let's check. So now we're going to consider the series with positive terms. So we're going to consider sigma with positive terms. That's just one third to the k. And what's true about this series? It's going to keep going on. Oh, hey, no, converge or diverge and why? Diverge. Less than one. Diverge, what did you say? Less than one. Then it's in there. What did you say? Well, one third is less than one. So oh, let, I got you. So what does that mean? It means it diverges. No. Oh, it goes to zero. I'm sorry, it goes to zero. I'm so sorry. Uh. It's not a P series. So a P series oh. with P less than one diverges. A geometric series with R less than one converges. Well, uh, so this is a convergent geometric no. You could teach us nicely. R equals one third, which is less than one. <laughs> Therefore, the convergence is absolute. Down here, therefore, absolute convergence of the original series. Absolute convergence. Huh. Ethan, is that a question? So absolute oh, okay. uh, 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 series uh, 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 No condition, right? Yeah, unconditional. Right? Doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Yes. So if you have a series of all positive terms and it converges, then you throw in some minus. She threw down the one. <laughs> Perfect time. <laughs> Her little gift. Yeah, I think that's what I do. <laughs> that was so cool. All right, we absolutely need a break. <laughs> Shall we converge in 10? Let's continue. <laughs> All right. When you look at that series, Isn't that? Yeah. it's an alternating series that's so easy. Right? It's the easiest. Do you think? Is it easy? Yeah, I think it's easy. It does almost I like Do you think it converges first off? So with the minuses, do you think it converges? Yeah. The limit is zero. If the limit is zero and you've got alternatings, it's going to converge. We just have to go through the formality of showing the two steps. But the basic principle, if you sort of blend the two steps together, if the limit of this is zero, it's going to converge. Um, what about convergence versus, uh, what about conditional versus absolute? That's a good absolute. question. What was that? Absolute. An absolute? I feel like it will die. Another absolute? Duke? Conditional. Conditional? Conditional. Conditional. Oh, we're at 2-2. Two two. I think it's conditional. 2-2. Two two. Ben? Absolute. Ethan? Uh oh, now we're four absolute, two conditional. Slava? Conditional. Nicholas? Conditional. Absolutely. Richie? <laughs> Which one? Conditional or absolute? Neither. Conditional? <laughs> okay. None of these. Let's find out. None of these. Let's find out. Okay, first we'll do the alternating series part. We're just to start. We were wrong. So the limit of 1 over ln to the k as k goes to infinity, that's 0. So we get our first check mark. 
And then we have to show that the series decreases. And so we want to show that the terms are getting smaller as we go out. So that's what we want to show. So we have 1 over natural log of k. And we want to show this. Replace k with k plus 1. Cross multiply. And then exponentiate. Then we exponentiate, and when we exponentiate, we get to a point where we get a nice, simple statement that's true. So we go all the way back through, that checks. So our conclusion is, therefore, convergence by alternating series test. Yeah. All right, so convergence. Now we ask ourselves, is that convergent conditional on the minuses? Do we need the minuses, or is it absolute? So now we consider the series of absolute values. So we consider the series with positive terms. So we've got 1 over natural log of k. Huh. Converge or diverge? I concur. So let's think about the P-series for a minute. So the P-series, the most basic P-series is the harmonic series. And does that converge or diverge? That diverges. So if we have the series 1 over k, we know that that diverges. So, so we've, got, we've got this thing right there. That diverges. Um, 1 over k. That k is going to infinity slowly. Or I sh maybe I should say it. the k goes to infinity as it goes. Let's say the 1 over k's go to 0 slowly. Does 1 over natural log of k? go to 0 faster or slower than 1 over k? Slower. Faster. A little bit faster. Faster? Slower. So if we look at a graph, if we look at a graph, so if we look at a graph, oh, this pen is terrible. So we look at a graph, so there's, um, But you could graph k and Yeah, that's what I'm going to do here. So if we graph k and ln k, it looks like this. And they cross somewhere. But eventually, this is y equals x, and this is y equals natural log. So y equals natural log goes to infinity slower than x goes to infinity. Right? Natural log is going slower than x is going to infinity. So what does that mean about 1 over natural log of? What does it mean? It means it goes faster? It's going slower. Right, so this is going to infinity slower than the other one. So that means the fractions are going to 0 slower. So if it's going slower than 1 over k, which is divergent, then it's divergent. it has to diverge. So then what? it's conditional. Yes. Oh, we're still we can use a comparison. So we can use a comparison test. So let's compare. So remember, for a 1 over quantity, for this to converge, the terms have to go to 0 quite quickly. And we know 1 over k is not quick enough. Right? We have the p-series oh, thing. 1 over k squared, that goes to 0 fast. k squared goes to infinity faster than k. And k goes to infinity faster than natural log k. Yeah. Right, so we need to be above that so threshold. We, and that natural log of k is not. So we can use a couple of tests. We could use the integral test. We could use a comparison test. Let's try the comparison test. So let's compare to 
the series 1 over x. Let's see if we can do that. Okay, so the comparison test, our hunch now is that this diverges. And we're going to compare it to this known divergent series. Let's actually do the limit comparison test. Yeah. Because then, then we don't have to start. We don't, sometimes with the comparison test, you have to say, oh, wait, do I need which side of the inequality? Do I need this to be on? Blah, blah, blah. Let's just do the limit comparison. That's just a little more straightforward. So we're going to take the limit of a sub k over b sub k. And it's the limit of the series we're analyzing. So that's the a sub k part. So a sub k is 1 over natural log of k. We're dividing by the b sub k. So this is b sub k right there. That's b sub k. Oh, good grief. b sub k. X and x. So we're going to put an x or a k. Actually, let's make that up to be a k. So we're going to put that in the numerator then. Uh, let's just do it like that. OK. Limit as k goes to infinity, L'Hopital's rule. And up and down. Exactly. French. So we're going to take the limit. Yeah, and does, doesn't that give us k? Mm -hmm. yep. The derivative of the numerator is 1. The derivative of the denominator is 1 over k. 1 divided by 1 over k is k. Okay. So that. <laughs> Okay. It's infinite. And what did the limit comparison test tell us? It's infinite in divergence. So, if it goes slowly. It's no. funny, because the limit comparison, I was thinking that this would be less analytic strain on the brain. But with the limit comparison test, we said that if we get a positive real, they both do the same thing. We didn't get a positive real. We got infinity. So we have to analyze a little bit more carefully. So we chose a b sub k that diverges. Okay. Right, so our series b sub k diverges. And if this limit is infinity, that means the a sub k's are going to infinity faster than this divergent series. So therefore, we can conclude that it diverges. So the b sub k's, the, this series is a divergent series. And so we are comparing to a divergent series. And if this limit is infinity, this means this is like a worst case scenario. The a sub k's have to be uh, going to infinity, or the, the sum has to be going to infinity for sure. Do you agree? So. Michael? Ln k then goes to infinity faster than 1 over k? Uh, the a sub k, this is a 1 over ln k goes to infinity faster than 1 over k. Is that what you said? Yeah. That would be what we would be concluding. Yeah, which seems strange. But if you think about ln k as being less than k, then 1 over ln k is going to be more than 1 over k. Oh, yeah. Right? The, denom the denominator is smaller, so the yeah. fraction is bigger. Yeah. So yeah. the 1 over ln k is going to go to that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> it's hard to say. So if the b sub k is our, if the series b sub k diverges, and this limit is still infinity, that means that this series acts even worse than the b sub k series. If the b sub k series diverges, the a sub k series must diverge totally. if, that, if that limit's still infinity. So maybe uh, integral test. The hard thing about the integral test, we'd have to integrate 1 over natural log of k. Easy. You have to use. I'm just kidding. How do you do it? I don't know. Not u sub. Trig sub. Not trig sub. No. Integration by parts. Think witches and Good. brew Ultra and cauldrons. What? Ultraviolet voodoo. Ultra voodoo. <laughs> that's the same thing he said. That's that's yeah, that's what he said. He said integration by parts, which is voodoo. Oh, that's voodoo. <laughs> <laughs> the sound is good. Like he yeah. Said yeah. 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 He's right. like a tall right. We all recognize yeah. your, that you are Very right. Very correct. Yeah. 
Super so correct. <laughs> Voodoo. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> correct. <laughs> Okay, so uh, all right, now we get to our two uh, two chests that begin with an R. Ratio and resets. Ratio. Yes. Conditional. Did I not write the conditional? No. So yeah, let's write that down then. Um, conditional convergence, yes. That is our conclusion. So therefore, conditional convergence. Do we have the third exam and then the final? Yeah. Gotcha. We have break, though. Do you want to yeah, see yeah. the calendar change? No, I know. I was just kind of just a rough idea. Unless you want to take the final first. I didn't take this as Yo, I'm not sure. scared. You won't. Okay, so the root and the ratio test. These tests are two tests that you use quite a lot because uh, there's many times, all the tests that we've seen up to this point are pretty particular. Alternating series test has to be for alternating series. Integral test has to be for something integrable. So they're pretty, pretty narrow, narrowly, they work for very narrowly defined series. The ratio and the root tests are a little more general. The ratio test in particular can be used for quite a few series. So here's what the root ratio test says. So we take the limit of the ratio of consecutive terms. So a sub k plus one over a sub k. Those are consecutive terms. And the conclusion is pretty simple. It should remind you of the geometric series. If that ratio is less than one, convergence. If it's greater than one, you get divergence. And if R is one, it's inconclusive. So it should remind you of the geometric series. Geometric series, the ratio less than one, you're going to get convergence. When the ratio is positive, cool. less than one, you get convergence. So this series has positive terms. So the R value can't be negative anyway. So as long as it's less than one, you're going to get convergence. So it looks like a geometric series type of conclusion. And it looks that way for a darn good reason. Let's think about this is a pretty simple analysis, but it gets to the point uh, pretty quickly. So if we think about what it means for this ratio to have a limit. So we have a sub, k a sub k plus 1 divided by a sub k, and it's approaching r. So if you go far out in the series, you have that a sub k plus 1 divided by a sub k is about equal to r. If you multiply both sides by a sub k, you get that a sub k plus 1 is about a sub k times r. Oh, it's written right there. If you multiply both sides by a sub k. So the further you go out in the series, the more the next term looks like the previous term multiplied by r, which is what a geometric series is. A geometric series, if we start here at a sub k, the next term is r times the previous term, the next term is r times the previous term. That is a geometric series. So the ratio test works because in the tail you have a geometric progression and we know that geometric progressions converge when r is less than 1. So geometric series is hidden inside a ratio test. It's also going to be hidden inside a root test. Michael? Is this the same thing that we were doing for the sort of third part on some of the previous problems with the absolute convergence? Well, the absolute... I mean, with those ones, we are looking at sort of the part where we're saying that the next term in the sequence is greater than the previous term or less than the previous term. Less than the previous term. term. So for the alternating series test, oh, yeah. for the alternating series test, we look at the comparison of them. Yeah. But that, we're looking at the strict comparison, not the ratio of them. Could you just rearrange it? You might be able to. Yeah, time. I was just thinking of that. And if you did do that, right, you'd be, it would be the a same ratio thing. less than one. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. In the, uh, in the alternating series test, and that's probably how you would prove it. This book, I don't think it shows us the proof of it. Um, 
So if we were to divide both sides by the a sub k, then we have exactly what you're pointing out here. Um, my inequality is not going the right way, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is the same thing? Yeah, it's the same thing. Okay, cool. Yeah, I didn't even think about that with the alternating series. Oh cool, good observation. I did not connect those dots at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... <laughs> good observation. All right, so let's take a look at this one. The ratio test is especially helpful when you have factorials. When you have factorials, the ratio test is great because you can get rid of the factorial part when you do the ratio of consecutive terms. So here's what we're going to do. So we're going to take the limit of a sub k plus 1 over a sub k as k goes to infinity. So that will be the limit of minus 2 to the k plus 1 over k factorial, k plus 1 factorial. And let me point one thing out with the signs. All right, I just wrote that down. Just pause for one second. Let's come back. So this says infinite series with positive terms. And when we look over here, this has a switch in it. And so what we're going to do is take the absolute value of those so that we're checking to see if there's absolute convergence. And if there's absolute convergence, then there's regular convergence. So if there happens to be negative terms in there, we just take an absolute value. And, and if that converges, then definitely the other one will converge with the minuses. So now with the ratio test, there's always going to be a lot of cancellation. And let's make sure that it's clear how things are canceling. So do you agree that when we look at the negative twos, there's one extra negative two in the numerator? Yep. And if we're taking absolute values, we can make that a positive two in the numerator. In the denominator? K plus one. Just K plus one. So K factorial is right there. K plus 1 factorial is K plus 1 multiplied by K factorial. And so the K factorial parts cancel. Do you see it? So if we think about K factorial divided by K plus 1 factorial, K plus 1 factorial is K plus 1 times K factorial, so the K factorials cancel. Just like if you have 6 factorial in the numerator and 7 factorial in the denominator, the denominator is 7 times 6 factorial. So the factorial parts, the, these things can always wipe out. So if you have a k plus 1 factorial and a k factorial, it will always cancel down to just a k plus 1. Always. And that limit is 0. And for the root and the ratio and the geometric series, if that number is less than 1, therefore converge by ratio test. Yeah? So if we got something that diverges when we use the absolute values, then it then would we have to like take away the absolute values? Then we would have to treat it like an alternating series. Okay. And we couldn't use this for that. So, if, so that's a good point. So if, this, if we did get something here that diverged with the rate uh, well, it would have to be that we got something inconclusive. Mm. If we get that this diverges, that, oh, let me think about then that for a minute. Then it could, be, it could be conditionally convergent. Yes, good point. So yes, so if this diverged, we would then have to, this right here is an alternating series, so we'd have to go to the alternating series test then. Typically with a, a factorial, it's going to be easier to do the ratio test, and you're just hoping. Factorials are so powerful, if they're in the top, it probably diverges, and if they're in the bottom, it probably converges. And not only converges, probably converges absolutely, if it has minuses. 
So, but theoretically, you're absolutely right. If this could, if this did diverge, um, we could look at the alternating series test. Yeah. All right, well, let's do this one. So limit of a sub k plus 1 divided by a sub k. So we multiply by the reciprocal. Yeah? Uh, what are the rules for factorials and negatives? Negatives? Like, like if it's factorial, but it's negative. Uh, we don't have any of those. Okay. DNA. Yeah, so our definition of factorial. Um, it's multiplied up to one, right? Yeah, multiplied down to one. But of zero, it's one as well. Yes. Both. Zero factorial is one by definition. Okay. Just because it helps with rules. But we don't have a negative numbers factorial. Yeah. They go up to zero. They go up to zero. I feel like there is some sort of definition with negative numbers with the factorial, but I don't know what it is. Whatever. We won't see it. Obviously, it's not that important. We won't see it. Okay, so. Okay, so our cancellation here, we'll have, uh, let's see, the there's one extra four in the bottom. So we'll put a one fourth there, and then this part I'm going to group together. We have two squares, so we could do that kind of thing. And that guy right there is one of those indeterminate forms. As k goes to infinity, the inside is one. Oh, that's not an indeterminate. The numerator is, oh no, that is indeterminate. That's a k. No, it's a two. That's not indeterminate. So what is it? What's a what? What's it two? One! <laughs> what happens the, to the top four? Where has the it top one? four. That four? Yeah. That four cancel with this four. Because here. Are fours? Say again? So how is there one four? Because there's one more four in the bottom than there is in the top. So. Do you see it? So if we uh, have four to the k over four to the k plus one. 4 to the k plus 1 is 4 to the k times 4. Well, no, I see. You see it? So those two cancel, and we're left with 1, 4 down below. The other part, if it was k plus 1 over k to the, inf to the, to the k, that would be indeterminate. But this one, the limit as k goes to infinity on the inside is 1, and 1 is just squared. It's not to the infinity, so it's certainly not indeterminate. So 1 fourth. Do you see it? So when you yes, take. Yes, actually, yes, I do. Never mind. See it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the limit, this limit symbol can be pushed inside. And then you have the same uh, exponential top bottom to divide the right. coefficient. So k yeah. plus 1 over k, they both are linear. So the limit is the ratio of coefficients. That limit is 1. Mm -hmm. And then 1 squared is 1. Dennis? Do we even need to use ratio for this one? Uh, what, else, what would you use otherwise? You can't just take a limit? Taking a limit's never enough. Because taking a limit just decides whether it could converge or not. Oh, OK. Right? right. right. So the, right. Limit, the limit has to be 0, but that only tells you that it might converge. Right, OK. That makes right. sense. Yeah, so we sort of do that in our head anyway, or we should. Yeah, um, no. Well, we think about it. it. Because if that limit is not zero, then you can conclude divergence. Right. Okay. But you can't conclude convergence without a test. Not conclusively. Not correct. <laughs> so, yeah. so this is less than one, therefore converge by ratio test. Less than one. Just like geometric series, less than one convergence. Woo! What's our hunch on this one? Just knowing our growth chart. Diverge. Diverge. Tower power goes faster than infinity uh, factorial. 
Let's check the, the limit. Last like one you said, you check the last one. Let's take the limit. Huh? All right, power this. tower. So should we say absolute for this one as well? Is this power the tower. Oh, last one, did we just assume it was absolute? Or did we not even check? The so the only time we ever use the word absolute is if we have an alternating series. Okay. okay. If we don't have an alternating series, we don't need to talk. Does it? It just doesn't make any sense because it's all positives. Absolute is used if you have negatives interspersed, right? And then you change them to positive. So we don't need to talk about absolute convergence unless we have negatives. If we, if the entire sequence is negative, we can just divide by negative. Then we just factor out a negative, and then we can use the ratio test anyway. Mm-hmm. Nice. Mm-hmm. Smart. That's correct. That is correct. So, ratio of consecutive terms. What are we doing again? No, we are doing this one. Oh, okay. Ew. Yeah. I thought we were just like it diverges and then we're good. No, 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 no. Well, um, call yeah. it a day on it. We, I mean, we could do that, I guess. But, you know, that's why I said we should take the limit. My goodness. So taking the limit of that, we can't do it but the definitively, terms, so the, it's... The terms of, don't even go to yeah, zero. So why can't you just look at it and be like, well, the growth chart? Well, well that's what we don't... We, yeah. we, that builds our intuition that the k to the k grows yeah. faster than the k factorial, but we want to do it mathematically. It's not good no. math. That helps inform our intuition. We should know where we're going. But we can prove it definitively, theoretically. <laughs> the terms don't go That's to so zero. reassuring. That's awesome. <laughs> well, we, assuming we can what take this limit, <laughs> assuming we can take this limit, let's see, can we take this limit? That's such a scary thing. All right. So let's try to take this limit. So where? let's look at the factorials first. Where do we have, what do we have left? K plus one. K plus one at the bottom. K plus one there. So we've, we've now taken care of this one and this one. Everyone agree with that? Yeah. There's one factor in the denominator, k plus 1. Now the numerator, what we have to do is peel apart this thing so it's going to be k plus 1 to the 1 times k plus 1 to the k. So we're going to sort of pair off the k to the k and the k plus 1 to the k. And these guys cancel. Those two factors cancel. So now we have something that's looking very indeterminate. Oh, what does that mean? So indeterminate. If you take the limit, I mean the derivative, not just one. That looks like e. 1 plus 1 over k to the k, that is e as k goes to infinity. So that is, what's its relationship to 1? That's greater than 1. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Yay. Therefore, divergence by ratio test. Rat test. Hey, what if we're really bad at math and I put you know, it diverges, and then I screw all of that up. How many points out of five? I'm not answering that <laughs> question. <laughs> you get a zero. Hmm. Okay. So we have that growth chart model, and we could have heuristically said, oh, the k to the k goes to infinity faster than the k factorial, so this must diverge by the divergence test. But that's not very, it's not very mathematical. If we can mathematically do this, we want to do it. And so we can do this very easily with the ratio test. Show that it diverges. Is it not e plus 1? It is not. Right. So what is <laughs> e equal again? 2.7. Right, but like, how, how do you get e? Well, how do you get e from 2. here? 7. Right. Somebody, how do we get e from there? Take the natural line. Natural log, we let y equal 1 plus 1 over x to the x, take the natural log of both sides, drop down the exponent, so take the limit process. of both sides. Is that almost like an identity? Just yeah, it's like an identity. Honestly, it is an identity. Just we did a bunch of them just two, no, week, two, Tuesday two weeks ago. Literally, after 10-2, there was a grain in my brain. 
<laughs> right? Because you guys remember doing these, right? Where you take the natural log of both sides, you pull down the exponent. Oh, yeah. You yeah. set it up so that it's like L'Hopital's rule. You take the derivative top and oh, bottom. Vaguely. I remember <laughs> that, yeah. This was only two weeks ago. I can't remember just the end. Like the it's just like that equals <laughs> two weeks ago. Yeah, it seems like ten weeks ago. Might have been two years ago. Oh, wait, there must have been one more. The amount of information you have to absorb every week. Yeah, it's a lot. Imagine doing this in 10 weeks. I almost did. Yeah, taking Calc 2 compressed into 10 weeks. Well, that's the only thing you're doing over the summer. <laughs> yeah, that would be all you could do. Yo, I heard Stephen Wolf made it not so bad. Okay, so here we've got another one. You guys tried ratio right. test. So set up your A sub K over your A sub K plus 1 over your A sub K. Zero. Take Aren't the limit. About the last one? Why well, didn't write stuff down? I'm gonna have to go back and look through the notes. But like, how, how did you how? How? Which step are we? Up. <laughs> Up. <laughs> yeah. How did how did you get from that multiplying stuff to this thing on the right? So k factorial divided by k plus one factorial. There's the extra k plus one from this. Uh, so you just like plug in numbers to kind of see it? So k plus 1 factorial is k plus 1 multiplied by k factorial. Okay. So k plus 1 factorial under k factorial. Cancel correctly. I don't know how you would do all that nonsense. Those do cancel. So there's one k plus one left. Now it brings it all. Okay. That's what's nice about the ratio test with factorial. The factorial part will always go away. I just haven't seen a lot of factorial, so I was like, I don't know how you did that. Yeah. Is it one over k to the six they get on? Wait, Let's see. I got k plus one, one k to the six. Is it k over zero? I mean, to the fifth. We're gonna go right here. That's what I got. So I was just trying to figure out how to cancel this. I got to here. How do you cancel this crap? Do you do K? Do you get one over K and six? Do you do get K over this? Wait, what? And there's always I don't understand how. It's in those cases, so it's k plus 1 over 6 times 7. So now your k plus 1 will be kind of like the last one. k plus 1. k plus 1. Yep, that's good. And then these two can pair off together. So we have k plus 1 over k, which is going to be exactly like the previous one. Yeah, so you're right there. So you're going to use that turn. This guy here is K plus one. Just, so cancel, cancel. So you get one over K to the six, right? Yeah. What? One over K plus one goes to the six. K plus one to the six. Then you start dealing with those two. Those two are going to be similar to the other four. I don't know. You have K plus one to the six in the top, and then over here you just have K plus one. What happens to the other five? That's what I'm talking Listen. OK. What cancels that? I don't know. So I thought you said this, these, this, and this. Okay. Got it. Okay. I thought if these canceled out, you would have one to the six. Is that not how that works? If you, what I do is I don't, I can't see it like he does. I plug in a value for k. And that kind of helps me see. Do you know what I mean? Like, just I, I, I know, but that also sounds hard to see, you know? So, so these will cancel. No, well, kind of. We still have the two of it. Where did this one come from? So this wouldn't just be covered. Oh, I guess it is to the fifth. I understand. So it's K plus 1 to the fifth on top. Yeah. I see. I guess I over K to the six. Over K to the Okay, cool. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. 
Because there's actually six of those. Yeah. Not, I was like, it just goes to one. So one of the, one of the six now, right? No, like the whole I'm smart. So it... I don't know. Oh, yeah, zero. Just kidding. Yeah, power is higher. Yeah, zero. Yeah. All right, let me power. All right, let's go through this. You won't. Um, okay, the factorial part. Does anyone have lingering questions on how the factorial part reduces down to just 1 over k plus 1? Anybody not see that 100%? Yeah. No, I Whoa. don't understand. I just know that's what we do. So, <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. So if we have k factorial over k plus 1 factorial, do you agree that k plus 1 factorial is k plus 1 times k factorial? Sure. I don't times. know how. Before. Just like this. So if 7 factorial, you can peel the 7 off, and then you have 6 factorial to the right oh, of it. Oh, okay. You, and you can keep doing that in all sorts of weird ways. If you have 9 factorial, you could write it as 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 factorial if you wanted. Okay. Right. So it's just a sequence of multiplication where you're subtracting 1. So k plus 1, you peel that off, and then you're left with k, the next integer, down. So that's a common way that you're going to, you, that's why we use the ratio test for factorials because we can always cancel that part out. So that will reduce, that will reduce this part. And then we're left with the k plus 1 to the 6 and the k to the 6. So we're going to treat that as one thing raised to the 6th power. Mm. One point oh, to the sixth. So it goes to 1? So... The limit is 1? The limit of this is 1, yes. Yes, yeah, yes. And then you do the other side. So the limit of this is 1. And the limit of the limit the left of side that is 0. Is zero. Zero times one. Oh, it's times. So it's zero. Zero. And zero, zero is, is definitely greater less than, than or equal to zero. So therefore, more of the equal than part there. Or it's less than one. See, what am I doing right now? Did you just shush me? I swear to God. Trying to pay attention. So okay, that okay. Let's just take a look at that. If you cancel the k plus one. <laughs> Let's see if there was if there's any funny business. So, or we could have limit of k plus one to the s to the fifth over k to the six. So here, if you were to multiply out the top, don't you have a um, the dominant term in the numerator being k to the fifth? So you could write that. Now, if you were to FOIL it all out, you'd have a polynomial with a leading term of k to the fifth. That k to the fifth term dominates. And so then this would be the same thing as the limit of 1 over k, which is 0. Yeah. Can we just say that the order of the denominator is higher? That would be a good way to think. Yeah, if you have two polynomials and the higher orders in the denominator. It's like 2k plus 1 quantity factorial. 2k plus 1. Yeah, it's a little hard. Okay, let's take a look at our, pretty much our, is this our last test? Yeah. It says only two we have left are root and. Root and ratio. Ah, I feel sad. Wait, what are you talking about? No more tests. Well, <laughs> so only one, only one of us is sad that there are no more tests. I guess this creeps us closer to power series. Uh, Do you have to worry about plenty of math left to teach us? What's that? You have plenty of math. Plenty of math left. To we'll be happy that this is the last test. Wait, is this the, are you saying that happy. this is the last section that's going to be going on the test? No. Okay, was, that's why I was confused. I was like, what are you talking Just about? Just the last integration It's like, we have like a lot of time then. <laughs> we have a lot to do. Really <laughs> Power series will take up a lot of time. Oh, sweet. Okay, so the root test is used generally if you don't have factorials and you've got something raised to a kth power. Because the root test can just pull off that power. So the root test says we're going to take the limit of the kth root of a sub k. So ratio test, 
limit of a ratio root test, we're going to take the limit of the kth root of a sub k, the kth root of the kth term. Now, conclusions are exactly the same as the ratio and the geometric. Less than one convergence, greater than one divergence, equal to one inconclusive. So let's just look at the proof for a second. So if the limit is of the kth root of k is rho, that means that if k is very large, a sub k, if you were to take the kth power of both sides right here, when k is very large, the kth term is like rho to the k. So that means that we have a very geometrically looking progression. If a sub k is acting like rho to the k, a sub k plus 1 is acting like rho to the k plus 1, so if you replace the k's with k plus 1, etc. Well, this has that geometric progression. We're multiplying consecutive terms by rho to get from one term to the next. Again, geometric. And so again, we use the geometric conclusion. If the, if the tail of the series is acting like a geometric progression with a common ratio of rho, well then rho being less than one will give us convergence greater than one divergence. And if rho is one, that's inconclusive. So it's very similar to the ratio test, that when you do this, if this limit is rho, then you raise both sides to the kth power. That means a sub k is about equal to rho to the k for large k. And we use rho because we've already used p in the p series? We've already used p. We've, and, and this rho is Greek letter R. So it's kind of like the, it's kind of like, it's a play on ratio. R for ratio. This is the root test. It's the root test, but it's, it, but it's got a ratio. Rho is the common ratio. Why not it's just confusing. use R? All the old books did use just R. They used R for the ratio test and R for the root test. They just wanted to think, I think, distinguish the root test from the ratio test so that you knew you were talking about the root test. They That's still use the Greek. But they use Greek. Yeah, Greek why, why do physics and math use That's the same moral. language, but the symbols mean different things? What's different in physics? That's a density symbol. It was density in here, too. And now it's this. <laughs> there are only so many. Didn't we do, do, what did we, do, maybe I was lying, actually. Um, <laughs> when we were doing density, what did we use to represent density? I'm pretty sure it was, Q. Used, it was not this. I don't remember. Did you say Q? No. We were using Q? <laughs> That's what I used. <laughs> <laughs> We were not using Q. He's got his own system going on. Yeah. Yeah. We were using Q. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. were we using? Or was it surface area? That's a good question. That's what it, yeah. or, or we were, no, we were using delta for this. Weren't we? Just we were using delta? Yeah, no. no. I think it was D. I think it was D. Yeah, like D. Yeah, like D. Yeah, like D. Yeah, like D. Yeah, acceleration. Yeah, that's it. Physics, they used real density. It, it was in the drag yeah. equation. I'm not sure if it was like the surface. That equation. Yeah, it looked like CPA. CDA? No, it looked like CPA. C sub P. CPA? Yeah, instead of C row. I don't know. Who knows? I don't care what they use in business. We're using row. Because remember, a limit is not equal. Right, so this, this, so if the limit of this quantity is rho, that means these guys are getting super close to rho. So that means if we take the kth power, the a sub k is getting super close to rho to the k. Yeah. All right, so let's do one of these to see. All right, so root test in general, if you have something raised to the kth power, so this is, we had one just a couple a week ago where we said, oh, let's just wait until we get the root test. This is these is that, ones. Is that the one? It's very close to the one if it's not the one. So we're going to take the limit as k goes to infinity of the kth root of this thing raised to the kth power. So the kth root of that quantity to the kth power, those two k's undo each other. And we have the limit of the ratio 2k over k plus 1. And that limit is 2. We have polynomial divided by polynomial. They have the same order. 2. That's very nice. Yes, So that is greater than 1. 
Therefore, it diverges. It diverges by retest. So what happens if it's one? Inconclusive. So different test or we different test. test or maybe different test. Well, what it's inconclusive, maybe. So if you all the tests fail, yeah. What if every then you'd fail. probably have to use a numerical analysis method. Which Wait, if they're all failing, does that mean it diverges? No. Wait, what? Well, that's <laughs> <holy>. <laughs> that's an example of a, uh, an equation. Uh, or, uh, by uh, failing, he means inconclusive yeah. over and over and over. Yeah. A ser can you, is there a series that is, is uh, inconclusive on all tests? Like a simple one? Like we don't know what I'll have to look. I don't know. Let's see. I mean, there's definitely ones that are inconclusive like, uh, on one, and then they, another test possible. is conclusive. I don't know about one. I'll have to see if there's a series so that we can find that's inconclusive kind of on all tests. Yeah. But it's sort of just a series that we have no clue about. All right, all right, all right. I, that's that's serious homework. <laughs> serious homework. Yeah, we just leave it at that. You know, <laughs> it is what it is. All right, so this one is so important. We're going to learn something really cool here. Keyword there. So the kth root of k approaches. Hmm. All right, let's see. Excuse me, what? So let's take the limit as k goes to infinity of the kth root of this stuff, kth root of a sub k. So this is equal to the limit of, in the numerator, we have k to the 2 over k. In the denominator, we have 2. Do you agree? Yes. Kth root is a one kth power. So in the numerator, no, there's not much we can do yet. So we have that. In the denominator, the kth root of 2 to the k is certainly just 2. Now I'm going to rewrite this as k to the 1 kth squared over 2. I'm going to write it that way because we're going to have this question that's above, what's the k through to k, as k goes to infinity. So if we know what the k through to k approach is, then we're good. Then we can plug that in and square it. Can you just make it 2 over k? That's where it came from, 2 over k. Um, it, but we want to, we want to boil it down to... So we want to boil it down so that we can analyze what the limit of this is. As soon as I said it, I processed what you just said. So How do you know it's one? The approach is zero, so no. infinity. it's infinity. This is an indeterminate form oh, because we have infinity to the zero. Yeah. So there are going to be some infinities to the zero that approach numbers. There's going to be some infinities to the zero that that are uh, that approach infinity. Wait, approach well, infinity. But if they're both k, aren't they approaching infinity at the same speed? No. 1 over k is not going to 0 at the same rate that k, you know, they don't necessarily. We can come up with mul different functions that will have the same indeterminate form that have different limits. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, it's just like the 1 plus 1 over x to the x z. We have lots of functions that have the 1 to infinity form that have, we've seen, we've done probably 5 or 6 that had different conclusions. Like very, very simple ones. If we have one, ah, that's dangerous. I would never have a couple of that. Okay, so right, one plus one over x to the x, we know that that goes to e. One plus two over x to the x, that's the same thing, right? This is one to the infinity, but it approaches e squared. So there's going to be lots of indeterminate forms that will have different limits. And so we can have a, an infinity to the zero approach any number of things. So this one in particular where we have just a k and a 1 over k, that's the one we want to analyze. So let's figure out what that does. So we do what we talked about doing earlier, but now we're going to do it. So we're going to let y equal that. And, you, and I'm going to use x's this time. So we have that. So we take the natural log of both sides. Yeah. And when we take the natural log of the right-hand side, we can bring down the exponent. <coughs> and 
And then we take the limit of both sides. And on the left side, I'm going to move the limit to the inside. And this will be the limit as x goes to infinity. And on the right-hand side, the limit as x goes to infinity, I'm going to rewrite it as ln x over x. Because <coughs> then it is indeterminate, infinity over infinity. We can use L'Hopital's rule. So that will be one limit over x over 1 over x. So that x. limit is 0. So then when we exponentiate both sides, we get the limit of y is equal to e to the 0, which is 1. So the kth root of k approaches 1. Question. Well, that makes sense because exponent rule says if you raise to the zero, it's one. Stop it! Stop it! <laughs> I will get it. Nice. <laughs> what? Yes, dude. It does not approach one because the exponent is zero. No, no. Not true. Even though in this case it looks like that may be the reason. So take oh. that idea and run with it, is what you're saying? So this is our limit. So the, what is our conclusion? Converges. 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 So that's less than one, therefore converge by the root test. Conclusively converges. Conclusively converges by the root test. Yes. <laughs> So the kth root of k approaches 1. Well, why can't you just do that? I think you explained it, but I probably like blinked out. But um, <laughs> why, can't you, why can't you just like do the function instead of function? Like, so he said that that just equals 1 if you just. But, you, but so uh, infinity to the 0 is an indeterminate form. Oh. You so that would be one. just like <laughs> this is an indeterminate form, Right here we have 1 to the infinity, which is also indeterminate. Oh, okay. And this 1 to the infinity converges to e. This 1 to the infinity converges to e squared. So we have the same ideas with uh, infinity to the 0. Oh, okay. We can find a whole bunch of functions that have that same indeterminate form but have different values that they converge to. Can you just scroll down so I can see the rest of the row? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it just happened that this one time it was. It looks like, you, yeah. yeah. What Nicholas said, it looks like you can just say, just because the exponent's going to 0 doesn't mean the value is going to 1. But in this case, it is going to 1. So if the exponent is the most powerful, so it's 1 over x. Say that once again. So if it's x to the 1 over x, then it will be. If it's x to the 1 over x. In, yes, in this case it does. Yes. In this case it does kind of what we intuitively would think. But you have to think, but think to yourself though, if the base is going to infinity and the exponent is going to zero, you can imagine a base that's going to infinity really fast. That, so if this number down here is going to infinity really fast, if this is going to infinity fast, um, and this is going to zero slow, you can imagine a limit that's not one. But they're going to... In this case... They're both k, so... In this case, in this case, in this case, in this case, they have, they're related, which is why we get the one. But we can come up with that in determinant form with different functions. In this particular well, case, we do have a k and a k. It's good, it's good. Okay. It's kind of offsetting each other. K, k to the They're 2 good, over k. k to the 2 over k. No, k to the 2 over k. That's what we have. Oh, wait, yeah. King super. Oh, so it's always that. Right. Right. Oh. right. No matter what the power is. Michael. So on the test, do you want us to simplify k to the 1 over k like we did and go through the process, or would you be okay with us? No, yeah, you're, you're okay if we go forward from here. We can assume that the k to k goes to 1. All right. Yeah, we can assume that. Yes, we will assume that from now on.
All right, you guys try this one. So use the root test. Use the root test. That sounds like Freddy. Here we go. Is it really? Yeah. Man, that's why I don't do that stuff. Here we go. Use the root test. Mostly because I'm probably. Take the cave root, the, the, the cruth, the cruth, the cruth of it. Could you technically do this for a geometric series? I don't know. Really? I'm barely struggling for the concept. Because then the K would be gone. Yeah. Is that allowed? Yeah, I don't know. No. Okay. For a geometric series, we're like the one third to the K. Can you just use this? <laughs> you just don't want to use it anymore. It's one third. <laughs> Is it just you know, oh, the K goes Can you do that? K goes to infinity. I bet you can, but it's too far. Yeah, but that's the root test doesn't keep tell working, you what it keep working. Do I have a question? No, keep working. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but it's really minutes. pertinent to anything. We only have a few minutes, so keep working. So we can I forgot what to do here. Yes. Um, probably not the best person to ask you either. Like yes. I went to like this. I'll raise the one half. Oh yeah, and then we take the 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 Okay, so we see that there's a cake. Power, no, which clues us in to go with the K, th with the uh, root test, to go with the K3 to the <laughs> case of K. So we end up with Kth root of K divided by E. And so that limit is? So reciprocal of E. And that is less than one, therefore converges. So can you see this one? Can you see whether this converges or diverges? Are you think in your head about the retest? Yes. Um, what do you think happens? So let's go. Let's do the math. So take the limit. I just need to go. The K through. What's that? Because we just showed that the limit of the K through to K is one. That, so that's uh, that's what we just showed the last one. So we don't want to have to do it again. Once you've done it, you don't have to do it every time. Like this. So, so if we've done it a billion times on the homework, do we have to do another test? No. Yes. Cool. Right. K through to K, you do not need to show on the test. You cool. can assume that it's one. So what is this limit? Negative one fifth. Checks out. And the absolute value of negative one fifth is one fifth, which is less than one. Therefore, converges. Well. What does it mean? Didn't we say that it cannot be negative? Is that why we do the absolute value? Or? Yes. So the root test is when you're assuming all the terms are positive. So we can take the absolute value in the end. Or you could just take the absolute value right away. It's easiest to just take the absolute value if you have to, instead of always writing it. But so, you can still do it. You just have yes. To value. So a lot of books will write it right inside here. Okay. You just have to take the absolute value at some point. And then there's guidelines for choosing a test again. Yes. All right, so let's stop. It's pie o'clock. Is it? Pie o'clock. Pie o'clock. So, happy Halloween. <laughs> And the only Don't do anything is. weird tonight. Uh, yeah. That's like asking a bear not to shit in the woods. <laughs>